Okay, so today we're gonna do one short lecture. Um, there is one topic that I really wanted to cover because it is very practical and unfortunately we didn't have, didn't have time to talk about it uh, previously. Uh, but you know, today I want to spend a few minutes and after that we'll switch to Q&A and um, you know, discussion. On, on, on the grades and homeworks. So um, the topic of interest, the topic I want to talk about today is design of experiments. And um, you know, this is an extremely important topic uh, because you know, everything we talked previously was sort of theory, we, 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 we looked at uh, how well our algorithm performs based on, you know, train and test set, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is what we do want to know, what we do want to understand and what business cares about is how it actually performs in real life. And the only way to understand that is to deploy your algorithm and actually check its performance, right? And that's called, uh, you know, experiments. And we're going to talk a little bit of design of experiments. So the easiest, the most straightforward, the simplest way is what's called A-B testing. And, uh, you know, it is, in, in the essence, it's, it's a very easy thing, right? For example, if we're talking about, um, say, online stores, uh, and that's where you, you, business often does experiments, you, for example, can split customers randomly into two groups, control group and variation group, and then offer them <coughs> different, providing them different offers, and then look at the difference in the effect. But you can actually do the same thing in you know, real life stores or with real products, where you take and in use, for example, for each transaction, you either um, you as a control group or you do um, the, the, the test group, variation group, and then you compare results. And, uh, you know, overall, this seems like very, very easy. Um, you, know, you monitor particular quality of interest that, uh, you know, you want to test um, and you look at it at a function of time and you see how control group differs from um, the group with a treatment, right? Or this with, with a particular variance. Now you can in fact run lots of testers in lots of tests in parallel. Uh, you always have a control group. So you have a baseline, you have something to compare against. And then for different um, you know, tests, you can, you can select subset of uh, say requests or subset of customers. Um, and then you monitor it for some time until you get enough data to make uh, conclusions. And there's entire science on how to actually drive, derive statistically significant conclusions and how long you need to run tests for. Uh, often, you know, in marketing, people take it easier um, and they just, you know, run and see if there is noticeable differences in performance. You know, this is often used in, um, you know, in, in testing advertisements in uh, um, you know testing different type of discounts in testing different design of web pages um, etc cetera, etc cetera. so like a b testing when somebody talks about a b testing this is really splitting customers um, into two groups or splitting maybe you know requests into two groups and using one as a control and another as a variation now uh, that could be pretty much it but unfortunately, uh, uh, the A-B testing approach has it, um, you know, has it drawbacks. And especially if you run a lot of those tests. So one of them the, is that, you know, obviously you do not make any conclusions until the end of the test and then you need to process it. But what's more interesting is uh, to understand and to look at these tests from this explore-exploit dilemma. So the idea is the following that when you actually creating a test, you are sort of exploring your options. And the test is not necessarily the best option, right? And if you have several tests running in parallel, um, 
one of them will be better than the others. So pretty much if I think about, let's say, you know, if I used to think about web page design or some offers and I'm looking into conversion, which is, you know, how many, many customers is going to accept it. Um, there will be some offers that perform better than others. And so during this test time, you'll be actually losing compared to what you would create if you use the best strategy from the beginning. And so that's called this regret zone. Now, of course, if you knew what's the best, you wouldn't even have to run to, to create those A-B tests. You would always run the, the option that, you know, the best option. But the thing is, you don't know. And so the question is, is there is any way to balance this explore versus exploit strategy and try on one hand to still try different options, right? But then to somehow converge to the one that is the best with a minimal regret, right? With a minimal wasted um, cost number of customers. And um, uh, that's, uh, you know, there, there are ways of doing it. And uh, it's actually has, you know, it has a very interesting name, um, the approach it's called multi-armed bandits. Now, the, the theory comes from, you know, the idea, the theory comes from the game theory, from theoretical computer science. Um, and, the, you know, the, the, it's, it's about dynamically adjusting allocation and allocation in the sense, the number of customers or that, that you send um, into each of the tests. So to understand this, think about the following hypothetical scenario. And this is actually sort of the, the origin of this problem. Um, think about, you know, custom, well, think, think about a person coming to, uh, um, to a casino um, and, 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 you know, with some amount of money and of course wanting to win. And so you approach a slot machine and you don't know what the rate of the wins on that slot machine. Right, you put money, um, you pull the lever, and that's actually, by the way, why it's sort of the slot machine is also called one arm bandit. And so, um, you pull the, the 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 lever, you know, you get some reward, or maybe you lose your money, or maybe you get some reward. Let's say you lose your money. Your next step could be either try it again with this machine, or you might think this is unlucky machine, and you move to the next one. And then you try the next one. And maybe on the next one, you won. So what's your strategy? What do you do? Do you actually stick with this winning machine? Or will you go and, and, and try um, on, on some other machine, right? So going and trying on some other machine, that is exploration. Sticking with one machine that you believe gives you the best result is exploitation, right? So the idea is, and it, it's sort of a very, you know, it's a concept that, that's actually very applicable to each of us's life because, you know, you, you found something good, you either stick with it or you think like, well, there is something better around the corner, maybe I should continue exploring. And so the question is, what should be the algorithm to maximize your benefit? So when you kind of say enough is enough and stop exploring and start exploiting what you have, or you have like lifelong exploration, or if you kind of agree on something that is not perfect at the very beginning, you will exploit it, but you might have missed something much better around the corner, right? So this is a concept of explore, exploit. Does this make sense? Yes, no? Yes. Yes, yes. sort of, okay. Now, it's actually a very, very fundamental concept. And in fact, um, it, you know, there is a renewed interest to this concept recently because of uh, so-called reinforcement learning, right? The process of reinforcement learning. But for us, you know, we kind of focus just on this, on this pure concept. So the idea then would be the following. Instead of running A-B testing, what we can do 
is we can start running the tests and then monitor what's happening. And depending on the performance of the test, we can reallocate number of customers to each of the tests and push, put more customers to the test that are better performing. So let's say we're looking, we're comparing different advertisements. Well, and uh, we, we realize we start the test and we quickly realize that one of the ads are uh, attracting much more attention than others. But we started with 50 50. We, we, we show 50% of the ads, I'm sorry, we show one ad to 50% of the customers, another ad to another 50% of the customers. So, what we're going to do is we notice that customers click much more on the first ad than the second one, right? We kind of start allocating more and more, we start showing this ad to more and more customers. And eventually, if that's true, after a while, the second ad will be pushed out. And so, instead of sort of fixing, for a long time, the, the ratio, you know, 50-50, um, the better performing ad will push out the worst performing ad, all right? And that's sort of the essence of this dynamically adjusting um, of, of allocation. So um, then if that happens, and here is an example from the sort of previous picture, we saw the picture where we have this sort of big regret here, um, we also have different options. Let's say the light blue one is the best one. It slowly removes, pushes out all other options. And so the regret, right, a lost opportunity um, is much, much less here, right? So this is much, much more preferred version of testing. Now, the question is, how do we actually do this, right? So how you, what's the, what is that strategy that allows you to um, you know, push out other and how do you select, how do you select how many times you're actually going to pull this lever of the slot machine versus, you know, switching from one slot machine to another, right? So um, there are several strategies. There are two of them. The, the, the best known is one is called Epsilon Greedy uh, Algorithm and the other is called Thompson Sampling. So Epsilon Greedy Algorithm is the following. You, you know, every time you have the greedy algorithm, the word greedy, it usually means you select the strategy, sort of the most obvious strategy, the most nearsighted strategy in some sense. So with a greedy algorithm, um, there are two steps in it. So step one, um, with some probability, with a very large probability, you select the best performing algorithm. And with a small probability on each step, you select others, right? So usually this epsilon is maybe 10%. So with 90% chance, you select the best performing algorithm. So the way it works is the first, at very first run, you know, you, you, you of course split everything evenly, but then instantly you see which one performs better. And then with a 90% probability on the next step for the next customer, you select the best performing here. Now for the 10% the that left, uh, you know, you split evenly between among all other options. And so this is greedy. And then, you know, when the, when the experiment is done, um, for the next customer, you already reweight all the probabilities. You again see which one performs the best and you allocate to this, to that one. And so every time you kind of looking which is the best, and you're allocated. Okay so in terms of the slot machines, it really means the following. You come to the slot machine, you didn't win anything, you move to the next one, you want something, uh, you stick with, with that one, right? Until you start losing. When you start losing and uh, you lose a lot, so that average win is, lo is, is low, then you switch to something else, right? This 10% probability, even if you win, you switch to another one, all right? So that allows you to still explore, but the exploration is kind of lazy. Whenever you see something you know, winning, you stick with it. Okay, that's epsilon greedy algorithm. Thompson sampling is, is different. It's actually a much smarter algorithm. Um, so what it allows you to do is instead of um, looking at, uh, you know, sort of <clears throat> average win that you have on that machine, you look at the distribution um, of, of expected rewards. And from that distribution, 
you generate samples, and then you pick up you pick up the the distribution that generated for you the largest sample. So in plain English, what it allows you to do the following: you might have a machine that may be a, um, so you learn about machines by exploring, right? So when you first come to the machines, you know nothing about them. The more tries you make on the machine, the better you understand if this is a winning machine or a losing machine. And so what you want to do is when you don't have a lot of information, even for the losing machine, give it a chance to play, right? And so that's what the sampling does. Um, I don't want to go into details right now, in the technical details. Um, it's also called Bayesian approach. Um, if you're interested, I will give you references. But these are you know, two typical algorithms that are used uh, for, for A-B testing. So here is the results. So this is a comparison, for example, of epsilon greedy algorithm and Thompson sampling. Um, this is a, a, you know, artificial data. Uh, but if you look at this, there's this control group. Um, there is a, uh, you know, option one, uh, there is option two, option three on the left-hand side. And this is simulated traffic to the website um, for, the, for the advertising. And what you have on the left side, um, this is this epsilon greedy algorithm on the right-hand side, Thompson algorithm. And you, you, know, you notice that the, the, the sort of the, the distribution of the traffic or how many times the ad would be showing or how we redistribute during the A-B test um, customers, um, they look very similar on the left and on the right. Now, if we had A-B testing for all those, uh, you know, four options, then it continuously through the entire time would just stay at, uh, you know, their own 25% and not changing, right? 25% meaning number of people that we send this, that we send to this test. Here, uh, we all start with, uh, you know, 25%, but then since test A is clearly um, much better, you know, the algorithm sends more and more people to it. Now, with epsilon greedy algorithm, it does matter what happens. There is always some chance that you will select not, uh, that you will not send a customer there, but send a customer to other, um, to other approaches. And, uh, you know, in this case, it's 10%. And if you notice here, it never goes above 90, right? So it's kind of uh, reaches, reaches 90 and then stays there. And with Thompson, it actually, can take over completely and it reaches 100%. So Thompson, in this sense, is more efficient, but it is more, it's, it's actually harder to compute. But in any case, both of them are widely used um, to you know, have this dynamic adjustment um, of the sampling. And whether you choose sort of Thompson or Epsilon, the idea is this. When you have A-B testing, you test through all the time the same number of customers for variant A and variant B. Of, of your you know, model or, or you know, approach or, or, or creative, whatever. And when you have multi-arm bandits, uh, you dynamically reallocate um, number of people, number of customers for each of the um, approaches. And then as time goes by, you know, one of the approaches start dominating and taking over. And so literally you don't even need at the end um, of this to compare um, the results on, on variation A and variation B. Um, whether you do A-B testing or multi-arm bandits, you of course need to have some reward function, which means you know, how you actually compare. That could be convergence, clicks, you know, time spent on the website, money spent on your website, uh, you know, money spent in the store. Um, you know, it, it is up to you um, to select the right metric but these are two approaches to do the testing. All right, any questions on this? So just for clarify, when we use multi-arm bandits, so if, example, if you, were, if you have only control group and a testing group, so what's mean for epsilon greedy strategy, just we uh, go with probability, uh, I don't know, with probability yes. one minus epsilon to uh, algorithm uh, and with epsilon to our test uh, to our right. control group. So in Correct. control group, it's mean we do nothing or just uh, yes. human yes. intelligence. And right. uh, so uh, case uh, will be so. 
if uh, our algorithm uh, is uh, worse, uh, we just uh, uh, converge to do nothing or them. human intelligence just to control group, yes? Uh, if, so in, in epsilon greedy algorithm, um, there will be no convergence in the sense that... Um, if you decrease epsilon this time, I mean... Right, you can decrease epsilon this time. Typically you do not, but what's going to be happening if, for example, you know, this algorithm is, um, you know, better than the other one, right? Um, then eventually, because again, you actually, uh, um, remember, you start with this, right? Uh, so for example, you start with control and then best algorithm, right? So you can start with control and the other one. But if your sort of other algorithm performs better than control, it becomes the one with the epsilon probability of selection. So the, the epsilon is not kind of fixed with respect to one particular algorithm, but it always updates and points to the best performing algorithm. Does that make sense? No? Yeah, so epsilon is constant for all iter iterations, I mean. For no, epsilon, epsilon fixed as a number, it stays constant, but with this probability, we always selecting the best performing algorithm. And the best performing algorithm might be, might change as time goes by, because okay. you might see this one perform better than the other, right? So you can, for example, at the beginning assign um, probability one minus epsilon to this algorithm, but then you start trying and it performs better than the other one, then it will get selected with a probability epsilon. Okay. So epsilon is just sample probability for one customer. I mean, we just independent sampling for each customer. Correct. So we get a customer, customer comes in, there are two algorithms, right? Let's say we start with, you know, let's say we start, you know, 80% to one algorithm, 20 to another, right? So at first it will go to where 80 points because there is a high chance, right? Let's say the 80, then we got another customer, you know, it, it might go to the one where we, we first, you know, where we gave like 20%. Um, and then we see that on the 80% one, you know, the first one, the customer didn't purchase, on the second one, he did purchase. So the, then if that happens, the algorithm says, aha, uh -huh, the second one is better than the first one. And so now with, on the, for the third customer, I will send him to that algorithm with 80% and to the weaker algorithm with 20%. No, Does it make sense good. now? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. So that was pretty much it with, I just wanted to make sure, you know, you guys um, know that in real life, uh, you know, eventually you need to do A-B testing before deploying something. And so when you deploy solutions, you need to be able to do it again you know, sort of, it really depends on the maturity of the business. Um, most of the um, sort of traditional business, br sort of brick and mortar stores, right? They are on the level of, you know, A-B testing. And for them, sometimes even A-B testing is, is kind of state of the art. Um, and, and, and so then of course, you know, you, you offer A-B testing, but um, in the situation, when you're dealing right now, let's say with a large scale online stores that are quite advanced, they, for them, it's really not A-B testing anymore. It is more of this dynamic testing, um, either with sort of with multi-arm bandits approach. Okay. All right, good. So um, that pretty much it in terms of the material I wanted to cover, it was really quick. Um, one last thing is, um, you know, I want to just sum up of what we have done during this course. And, you know, I never called this course like retail analytics, but in fact, it is a retail analytics course because uh, most of the cases, use cases that we considered um, had to do with uh, retail, right? And uh, if you look at this diagram, um, you see here, sort of traditional 
kind of retail analytics uh, topics and subjects. And uh, we can actually quickly go around the circle and realize that we, you know, did at least half of them. So, you know, recommendation engine, yes, we consider collaborative filtering as an approach. We didn't do attribution modeling, uh, but, uh, you know, we looked at the, a little bit at the pricing. Um, we looked at, uh, uh, you know, cluster analysis for customer segmentation. We looked at the demand forecasting. Uh, well, we looked at the sales forecasting actually uh, for using uh, time series modeling. Um, you know, we looked at the churn analytics. We didn't do survival analysis. We did different approach, uh, purchase likelihood propensity modeling. Um, I, I think we also did a bit of it. Then cross sell and upsell um, this market basket analysis that uh, we did. So, you know, we covered probably, you know, 80% of the typical use cases um, within uh, retail analytics. So it's personalization, segmentation, you know, churn, and uh, sales forecast. In terms of the technique that we used, we looked at the exploratory data analysis, and then we did basic regression, classification, clustering, and recommender systems. Now, of course, this doesn't cover all the you know, data science techniques that are exist out there or being used, but this is probably one of the main, main techniques that are out there for us. Now, um, I actually took this slide from the very first presentation I did on the first lecture. And so I hope now it makes a lot more sense to you uh, in terms of this sort of pipeline, you should be able to like sort of feel it through by now. Um, you know, this, we, we, you've done uh, the steps in your homeworks with sort of data understanding, you know, data preparation, you know, model development and model evaluation. Um, we have not done model deployment, but you actually did some uh, sort of, well, you, you didn't deploy the model, but you used the model itself to answer some of the questions. By the way, now looking at the steps, right? One, two, three, four, five. Which of the steps took most of your time when you were doing homeworks? Preparation, probably. Preparation. Data preparation, yeah. Data preparation, yeah. So you suffered through it, okay. Um, and that's unfortunate truth um, that is out there that 80% of data scientists' time goes on to data preparation. All kind of ways to, you know, slice, dice, cut, remove, clean, filter. Um, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not fun, but this is a skills that you need. Um, without them, it just, you know, you, you, you cannot do anything. In some sense, you know, data science, um, you might even think about this as like, say, like chemist, chemistry is a science, right? And to be a chemist, being a scientist, so understanding, you know, algorithm, understanding things. But at the same time, you cannot be a good chemist if you actually cannot do lab work, right? And so here, this is sort of a lab work, um, you know, the, the, the sort of the fundamental things you need to learn how to do. You might also notice that within the cases that we considered, there were really sort of two types um, of, of data science. There is this data science for humans, and I call it decision science, and in fact, there are guys who call themselves decision scientists, not data scientists. And then there is what we call, I would call it data science for machines, which is more sort of product development. Um, and you know, data science for humans, or decision science, is when your consumers are decision makers within the company. So it's executives, product managers, designers. Um, and the goal for you as a data scientist is to build a model, draw a conclusion, and based on that conclusion, um, those executives will make certain decisions. For example, when we considered um, you know, retail stores and we looked at the sales forecast, this is for decision scientists because um, based on the sale forecast, uh, the procurement will make certain purchases and then the, the logistics uh, will allocate uh, you know, product to different stores. So that's very much a decision science. On the other hand, product development, this is something when the result of the algorithm is actually used by computers. So the consumer is a computer that would run certain type of predictions. 
for example, when we did recommendation service, this is, you know, the final, of course, end user is a human, but it interacts with computer. You're not there anymore. Nobody makes any decisions. It's a computer that makes recommendations. And so when you're more of a this decision scientist, decision role, um, uh, it, it is about designing, defining, sort of implementing metrics, running experiments, interpreting, experimenting, creating dashboards, communicating it to the leadership. Or, you know, if you are in the leadership position, making decisions on this. When you're dealing more with product development, this is really about developing algorithms, um, you know, training them, testing, deploying them, so creating software, right? It is more of a product development. And you will notice that in some companies, let's say, for example, Facebook already really even separates. They have a decision science group that are, that are dealing with, you know, particular strategy, strategic decisions based on the data. And then they have uh, machine learning product development data scientists or machine learning data scientists. Then um, the same thing happens with, um, you know, with, with Google, right? Um, and, you know, it's also, also depending on where you are in here, um, there are slightly different skills required. If you're on the left, it is, you know, you'll probably need more of also sort of, you know, visualization skills and much more of communication skills, right? And if you like doing consulting, you're definitely much more on the left-hand side. Um, on the right-hand side, these are more of engineering skills and knowledge of how to take your algorithm and integrate it into the system, make it into a product. Um, you know, some people are universal. Some people more to the left, some people more to the right. But this is sort of overall, um, you know, of different data science projects. Now, where to go from here? Well, um, you know, first of all, as I said, you need to, to, to know the tools, right? Because, uh, you know, data scientists that cannot cannot code that cannot make model is not a data scientist, right? Um, you know, we talked a lot about this rapid minor and that we selected rapid minor for this course. Um, you know, interestingly enough, there were quite opposite opinions about this. Some of you, uh, you know, hated it. Uh, some of you said like, why didn't you make us use it? I know Python, so I'm trying to use Python. I don't want to use this, this stuff. And some were saying like, like yeah, look, yeah, it, it's something might be useful. I, you know, I firmly believe that um, software development today is moving towards this uh, flow-based models. And in a few years, um, you know, there'll be everywhere. In fact, today, say, in, you know, in, in most of the clients um, and within BCG, we're using Alteryx, which is uh, very similar to Rapid Miner, which is, you know, flow-based development environment. And um, if you're good at it, you can solve a lot of problems really fast, right? So guys who are actually very good at Alteryx can, you know, partition the data, split, clean, et cetera, much, much quicker than I can do it in Python. Um, but it takes time. And some of the things are not very easy to do in, in, in rapid minor Alteryx. And that's where you, for example, can write your own code. One other thing to note is that, for example, Azure Machine Learning, which is uh, Microsoft, um, you know, offering product, which is a um, cloud-based product. In fact, we were thinking about using it for this course, but we kind of decided that's probably a little bit too much. Um, um, it's also, you know, flow-based, and you know, if you zoom in onto the slide, you will recognize most of the blocks. It's kind of uh, built out of this the same ideas as, as rapid minor Alteryx, but being on the cloud, it also provides a very easy way to integrate with other Microsoft services and actually deploy this into production and monitor. So that's where things are going. So, you know, if you want to be a data scientist, you definitely need to learn one of those environments. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, this, this course was kind of a push for you to, you know, understand the concept of this. If you want to go deeper, I would definitely recommend you learning Python. Um, you know, Python became de facto language of choice for data scientists. Um, it's kind of interesting that R, um, you know, is, is very popular in, 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 within science, within, you know, bioscience, within, you know, statistics. Uh, but within industry, it's kind of, you know, not being very widely used. Um, in fact, MATLAB is even more, more widely used among engineers. But so far, Python is, is the one that everybody uses. 
And so within Python, there are several sort of libraries, which is Pandas, Scikit-Learn, which I would recommend to, to learn. Um, they are, that, that will probably cover like 90% of, of your needs. One other thing which we have not done in this course, and I would have done it if we have more time, um, is Tableau. Tableau is visualization. And again, it is extremely widely used in business today. Um, you might think that you know, visualization is, is you know, well, no brainer. Now, Tableau allows you to create extremely beautiful pictures and extremely complicated graphs, and you can actually do it very fast, but um, it has a quite steep learning curve because it has certain concepts um, that they use that are not, you know, not sort of usual. You don't, you don't unless, unless you train um, on Tableau, you pretty much cannot use it. Um, but today, again, today, traditional mix in, uh, you know, a lot of businesses would be Alteryx and Tableau um, and, and Python, right? So that's the sort of traditional mix. And more and more businesses moving to, uh, say, Azure, uh, you know, Amazon or Azure um, services. So that's, that's the tools you need to know if you want to, you know, seriously get into data science. And this is, for example, what we ask for, um, you know, skills when we interview for BCG positions in data science. Um, and in terms of books, well, surprisingly, there was actually very, very few books that tried to bridge, you know, business and, and the actual sort of data science and analytics. Um, something we tried to do in this course, I still would, I still think that this data science for business book is probably the best one. Um, very good book, Predictive Analytics by Eric Siegel. It's actually a good read and a lot of interesting things. There is another book which is kind of older, uh, but still pretty good, Data Mining Techniques. It talks a lot about how, um, how data science is used um, in, in marketing. And it talks a lot about customer churning, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, second column, this is more for those who want to, you know, go sort of hardcore and understand, um, you know, the, the techniques. Um, if you notice, it doesn't say machine learning, it actually says statistical learning, modeling. Um, these books are written by statistician. In fact, two left, you know, the elements of statistical learning is sort of a Bible of anybody who works with data, um, written by extremely famous uh, professors uh, from Stanford. Uh, it, it's actually, difficult book, but it has the answers to all the possible questions about, you know, mod statistical modeling, everything else is sort of derived from the from that book. And introduction to statistical learning is just a simplified version of, of the book by Hestia. And uh, applied predictive modeling is also a very nice book, uh, quite detailed in terms of, you know, model performances. Now, sadly, this all books, uh, they're all using R as an example instead of Python. But again, this is just the result of, of R being more of, of academic um, language. Finally, if you want to do Python, um, you know, there are a bunch of books out there, you know, endless number of tutorials, online tutorials. So it's, it's very easy these days to start on Python. I would say Python for data analysis. This is book dedicated to, to pandas and overall sort of data exploration. And then uh, machine learning with scikit-learn. You know, Keras and TensorFlow, this is more for deep learning, uh, but you know, scikit-learn is what we do. And you know, data science from scratch kind of covers all those things. So that's where I would go, you know, uh, this is the books I would, I would you know, take and, and, and read if, if um, I wanted to go deeper into um, the data science topics. And uh, with that, uh, we're done. Um, yeah, we probably all miss that, 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 that building. Um, and I'll stop recording. Uh, give me one second if I find it. Um, I'll stop recording now and we can switch to you know, Q&A. Um, and, and after that,